Podkit, episode 64, Cool Gray, on Saturday, January 30th, 2021. And now, Florp the f- Fluples. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk64. Pod kit. Hey. Hey. Happy uh, 64. Wow. Wow. 64 episodes, huh? That's like, what, two to the fourth? I don't even know. That is, doesn't seem right, but maybe. Two to the third? Well, two to the two fifth? Two times two times two times two times two times two. Okay, that is six twos. Two to the sixth. Okay, that's better. Well, I was close. I, sorry, my brain's 32 bit. <laughs> Right. No, 16 bit, 16 bit, 16 bit. Ooh, you're retro. Uh oh. D- does that mean we've been recording for 64 weeks in a row? Yes. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> right. March right. March 64th. Yeah. No, I, I don't know if we've been recording for that long in a row. No, but hmm. this is our sixth year. Of, oh, so, it, so of the, the six represents the year. So we can only get what? Like. Six more shows in this calendar year. We might just meet that. <laughs> you know, that that sounds somewhat realistic. Yeah, maybe. it does. Actually optimistic. We, we've been doing better recently. Uh, it, our first it, year had like 20 episodes or something. So but technically, this is a recording in January. Yeah. Probably not released till February, but... Right. Of 2022? Uh, I'm not taking that long to edit. Okay. Hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, it's Brian, not me. <laughs> yes. I wasn't going to make that joke. Uh, I I heard there's follow-up. Is that true? During last episode, which was uh, Podcast 63, we kind of did a year-end thing, and we had a uh, friend of the show, Zach Scalco, on. There was a moment where Brandon was talking, and then I cut to me saying there were audio issues, and we continued on because uh, we tried a new timer website called bigtimer.net. There's a link in the show notes. Shout out to Cassie Williams, who... Uh, uh, had that in her newsletter, I don't know, a month or two ago. So that's where I found it. But by default, it plays this sound effect. And so it all went off for the other three. I had turned off sound, so I had no idea what was going. But they all were just, uh, there was a lot of yelling. And I think uh, several microphones uh, clipped their audio at that moment. But um, <laughs> There was just this uh, attack. <laughs> and I, I didn't know where it was coming from. And it was... It was a pop apocalyptic, uh, just apocalyptical. Yeah, I couldn't do it. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're we're using it again. Hopefully, it doesn't uh, gong. But and, and yeah. so it's funny. So before we tried to start up our show here with the timer, we thought, oh well, if we share our link, but we share the link with the setting of no sound when timer ends. We thought it would work. It turns out the links don't share that state. It is. It does seem strange to me that. Somebody would assume, oh, yes, people absolutely want a sound notification with no other context that this timer has completed. But I don't know. Maybe that's what people, I mean, in a browser, in a browser, to me, this seems very odd for this use case. However, I guess that's what phone timers do. Phone timers make a noise. Yeah, I guess it depends on what you want your timers to function as. Do you want it to be something you can keep off screen or do you want to be able to see it? Personally, I never want anything to make noise ever. Just done. Nope. No audio. That'd be a very, very poor timer in some ways. <laughs> well, you know, if you're if you're already not going to follow the timer, then, you know. You're just being realistic that you're, you're going to uh, ignore it anyway. Yeah, there you go. I might just close the tab. Close. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Well, that's okay. It won't gong on you then. and It'll just gong on everybody else. Thank goodness. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I think we're going to keep the show a little bit shorter this 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 time around. But uh, we have a few topics. First up is, hey, do you, you know Eleven T? I've heard of it. Yeah, so it's still cool. Uh, Ryan and I talked about it a bunch last fall. Uh, I think we've talked about it in our year end thing. Well, I've now rebuilt my whole website with it. So I've been d- deep in the weeds with it for the last like six weeks, maybe. Uh, and I was just committing updates literally as we were in our fringe before the show. Uh, so, so Brian, do you, you, you had to customize quite a bit more than the JavaScript Minnesota website, right? Yes. I have about 20 posts on my site in addition to another like 
maybe 10 other pages on the site. So there's like 30 or so pages that it needs to render as well as a bunch of assets and other kind of stuff that I, I involve. And there's more JavaScript and styling stuff that I have going. And how did you feel about all of that customization? Like, was it easy or was it kind of uh, difficult due to documentation and kind of existing ecosystem? Like, how was it? Yeah, so the 11T docs are pretty good when you're reading through them. They're a little more challenging to find something when you are deep in the code and you're like, I have this function. What can I do with it? It's really hard to find. Like, there's no, like, big function reference. So I found poking through the repository of the 11T source code a little bit a bit of like searching online, but there aren't that many, like it's still a pretty small library. So there isn't a ton of stuff online. So I found I was searching through github.com for sites that had the 11 T package as a dependency and just looking through the source code of random people's websites to try to just figure out and get ideas around Mm -hmm. how I can use things. And that helped a little bit uh, there, there's a, quite a few starters on the 11T docs page as well, which is kind of examples of different, different things. So there's some, there's some really advanced ones that I think someone who works at Google put out that does all the fancy Google optimizations that they recommend. You know, using WebP and like image stuff, and uh, I don't remember. There's is a while ago, but like you know, to get a very high scoring lighthouse score and well performing site. So there's a, a range of options there. So I struggled with some of that, but I, I got through it. Um, the site that, or my website I've had for, I don't know, five, I think I've, I've had that site since 2014. It was a Jekyll site that I moved over to a AngularJS version, and then I dropped that after a couple of years and then went back to Jekyll. So this Jekyll code base has been around in some way for six or seven years. And so I've been slowly adding onto it with more features and things over time. So... There's definitely a lot more work to put into this than I did for working with you, Ryan, on the JavaScript MN site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool, though. It's um, the 11T have like its core and all of that stuff that it does with plugins. Like, is any of that TypeScript like can you tell about what methods and functions are are supposed to do or exist? Uh, No, I don't think there's really any TypeScript in the whole ecosystem. Cool. That seems real good. (laughs) Yeah. There are a few notes in the docs saying this is the the syntax now. At 1.0, it's going to switch to this. 1.0. 1.0 isn't out. There's no code reference to anything beyond the current version in the repo as it exists right now. So it's just kind of like we plan to do it this way, which in my mind is like just don't put it in your docs. Then it's just adding confusion. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I last night and today I went through and added things like computing a hash of some of my asset files with the JavaScript and CSS files so I can do cache busting when I deploy my site. Now I deploy to GitHub pages, which seems to have a one hour cache on any asset. So it's not like it's a huge issue, but why not? Um, so I did some of that. I reworked some roll up stuff. I have fewer files emitting in the end now. So I've done some kind of optimizations there, but um, I did a, some very small visual updates, just some different Color, uh, colors influenced from Tailwind, which you'll be happy to hear, Ryan. Woo-hoo. They have good color palettes. The Tailwind 2 color palettes are a little different, but yeah, they're real nice. Yeah, I'm using the uh, cool gray as the background for both my light and my dark theme nice. on the site. So it makes the fun mode a little more fun because they have a slight hue shift in them as well, since they do have a slight amount of blue in them. So there is a hue to shift. There's a tag page now as well as like a quick archive page on my site of all my posts which is uh, kind of built around a feature that jekyll can't do at least with the plugins that github pages ships and so it's it's built around 11t can emit uh, multiple files from one template and jekyll with github pages stuff um, can't do that so um, i'm like emitting I, I'm like iterating over a dynamic collection of pages or of of data, and then I'm emitting a new page per entity uh, techn- like through paginating it uh, with a size of one per page. So this you just kind of have to get in that mindset and look through some of the examples. But mm-hmm. yeah, and, and I um, finally, I made a little template that emits redirect pages in the same way that there's a Jekyll redirect from library that is in the github pages gem for jekyll and so it basically outputs a small html file that 
has a like JavaScript location equals and then the new page to redirect to. There's like an HTTP header in the top of the HTML document for re- redirecting or refreshing to a different page. So a bunch of client side for things like GitHub pages, which don't, you can't cons- uh, configure the web server to do redirects. So that was fun to build. I have a, I do have a post on my site that goes into that. You have a post on the site that's made with 11D about how you made the site with 11D. Yes. Huh, that's cool. You can call it a meta post. I like it. (laughs) And now the post where I go into great detail about Jekyll is kind of a a legacy post on the site. But yeah. Those are the best. So it's been a lot of fun, a lot of tweaking and a lot of reading through docs and some source code. But it's, it's been fun to do. It's definitely, I, it's probably not like, it's definitely not as robust and with a large community and like smooth out docs and everything is worked out as something like Gatsby or Next or, or something. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think that's that's kind of the appeal to me as well. It's just a static site generator and it's definitely influenced from Jekyll, which is where my background was. So it seems like a good next place and it's all in Node with JavaScript. So it's a lot more familiar to me and I can kind of like hack my way through it in ways that I couldn't with Jekyll. Great. Well, another 11D. We have another one, so. Yep. Hopefully this time next episode I'll have my site done in 11D. But we'll see. Who knows? If it's just one page, I definitely think your site is would be a great thing to play around with 11D. Because if you're just emitting one or two pages or something, like, if it doesn't go well, you can rewrite it pretty quickly in something else, too. Yeah, I mean, it might. the problem is it might also be more pages, but I'm going to try to rewrite the first page first, and then I'll, I'll add more pages when I write more content basically for sure exciting stuff yeah so tell me about xpath oh go ahead yeah i was gonna say i threw another thing in here about xpath uh so there's a double segue uh yeah aren't those double segues illegal now it's not didn't that hurt hurt somebody no no those are called cars oh okay (laughs) um i don't know xpath is cool i was working with them uh, quite a bit more like month or two ago uh, at work doing some end-to-end testing with Puppeteer. And I just thought I'd call out, I think I've done this exact kind of topic in a podcast in the past. I just want to continue to say they're great. With with XFact, you can do uh, pretty cool things like get the text of a element in the DOM and you can like compare things based on the text. So if the text of an element contains some other string, you can select it. So it's just another selector language that is a lot more powerful than CSS. But it's definitely like roots in XML, which is good or bad, depending on how you feel. But it's fun. It's powerful. It's kind of a different mindset to get in. But I was amazed with myself. I wrote a pretty complicated selector, and it almost worked on the first try. And it was like probably 100 characters long. It's great. I remember in the old days, back when we had QA people, uh, and you would chat with them, and they would be talking about all of their... um all of their work, their Selenium tests, and they would be telling you all about their XPaths and, uh, you know, how much work it was to get all of that stuff. And it's like, why did you just add an ID to the element? And they're like, we can do that? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we do, we use the pattern kind of introduced from testing library, which is like a data attribute with test ID, so data hyphen test ID. And so that's an, a great way of like tagging something. Mm-hmm. And you're very explicit that that ID is only used in tests and you should only use that ID in tests. Don't mix it with your other code. If you need, if you need an ID, use an ID as well, but don't use both or use both over one or the other. That's, that's been a nice escape hatch, but it's almost like, to me, it feels a little easier and more, uh, maybe, maybe it's better. Maybe it's not, I don't know. Then test ID is very, you're, it's very clear to see what's going on. It's just, you're losing the sense of what what does this element really do? Like, what is it for that? It's just an ID. Whereas if you're text selecting like a button with a text that contains the word save, Oh, you, you kind of understand what that intention is for. Yeah. And it can get kind of tricky too, because you know, at some point maybe your site gets, um, you know, I, I 18 N ized. Yeah. And then you get, um, then you have to have your save code, your, you know, your, the code that's looking for save also be aware that this might not be in the same language. And yeah, yeah, I can get kind of messy. So that's true. It just depends on what you want to test. Like, do you want to test that the button exists or do you actually care or are you writing it from the user story perspective? Do you actually want to have a virtual user say, I'm looking for the save button? Yeah. Use XPath to implement, uh, implement Cypress tests on top of Puppeteer using XPath. 
Well, I mean, it it, it is kind of doing that. Um, when I've used yeah. Playwright, it will have you know a text lookup, and I don't know what it's using under the hood. Maybe it is XPath under the hood. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's a it's a pretty powerful tool if you want to use it that way. Yeah, and one other like feature that really makes XPath different from CSS, in addition to like selecting text, is you can go up and down the tree as many times as you want. So you can do like you can find a selector and then get its parent and like go up a few levels and then go over and go back down if you want. Uh, so you can kind of like wrap conditional things. So I use this to build that long selector I was talking about a minute ago. Um, there's a table of data and uh, it's a bunch of rows which have a bunch of cells in there. So I'm looking at this table and then I'm like, I'm like searching on the element like a TR or a TD kind of thing, right? So I'm looking at for each TR, if the first TD has this text in it, then go to the third TD in the same row and click the button that says delete, that kind of a thing. And that's something you really can't do with CSS. Uh, and it's and it's great because it, it makes the test a lot simpler because it's, uh, it's not so much of a do this, then do this, then do this in a loop. It's here's the selector and the selector language is doing that logic for you. And it, it either it's a binary, it matches or it doesn't match with makes your test logic a lot more simple because you're not having to own all that intermediary state as well. Yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, I kind of, you know, from like a testing perspective, the confusing thing for me is that like a lot of times the copy I'm working with when I'm building is like what we call FPO or for placement only, which is another way of saying I wrote it. And there's a possibility that it's going to, you know, get released to the world. But what's more likely to happen is like, as other people look at it, they're going to be like, I don't want to call it the save button. I want to call it the floor button because I love florps. And I want people to florp their, their fluples to, to the server uh, or, or not server. Right. But just, you know, yeah. And so like, I always cringe when I'm searching for specific text in a test, I'd rather, I'd rather do it, you know, not based on structure, but based on like an ID or a role, because like the, I mean, especially, especially in it, when you're doing like campaign work, like, geez, people will have all sorts of cutesy names for stuff. And that's not necessarily a problem. It's just, it's just a different, it's just a different structure. Cause like, I'm never, I'm never going to be working on, you know, other people's designs or other people's I'm, I'm very rarely going to be working on other people's copy that's finished the copy's never finished well right right so it's like well when that happens then like i can't be i can't be doing crap like that then all my tests will break that's, that's a good point for using something like a test id like that's because if the functionality is the same it's just like display text that differs yeah so i would yeah i would probably agree with you actually that test ids are better for end-to-end -end tests than using actual element text but for integration it's probably flip it and the text in the element is better because you can mock out and configure like the language and things sure and you don't want to do ids everywhere because that can get really confusing i see what you're saying i see what you're saying yeah nice cool well guess what it's time to talk about uh this github action you built brian yeah i'm sorry i'm just like slamming a whole bunch of javascripty topics here in the beginning but no man that's how it goes Yes, we, we had a little hackathon at my work this last week, and we had a team. We didn't win, and that's okay, and that was kind of the... I love how you start off this. We <laughs> didn't win. <laughs> well, I mean, like, there were there were things that actually have some business value. This was a, you know, a stretch always from the beginning, and that's kind of the idea, you know. I, I approached a hackathon as a good time to work with others and, like, figure out something... Do something different. Yeah, do something a little bit different, and... That's where I see the value, and I'd rather do that and get something out of it 100%. personally and like working with others versus doing something that might be more business impactful, but I hate doing it. And so I'm going to have a little more fun with it, of course. And so that's what this GitHub action is. So it's called PR Chatter because we weren't, it was, <laughs> we submitted this uh, idea name as like a very general thing, and PR Chatter is about as general as it gets. But Basically, it is an action meant to be run on a PR review step on GitHub, and you configure it with a Tenor GIFs API key, uh, which is like the main competitor to Jiffy, but it's not owned by Facebook. And it will look at the text in a pull request uh, review if it's approved or if you request changes. So it looks at the text in that review body content, and it runs it through. There's an NPM package called Sentiment, 
and it does some sentiment analysis based on some studies from a bunch of years ago. They also have some emoji, but um, I don't know how updated those words or I think the emojis were updated like four years ago. So it's not like super, super recent, but. But you know what? It's not a point, you know, sub one NPM package. It's 5.0.2 and that's what matters. Sure. Yeah. Even more. It's a pull request. It doesn't matter. Like this is a an action for the lulls. It's not like a mission critical thing. So whatever. But basically it'll it'll tag um text that you pass into it. It's all offline and it runs through this this it has a JSON file of like thirty three hundred words and a score to them if they're negative or positive. And so we have some other random like maybe it'll be rickrolled, maybe it'll pull a a GIF that's just popular on Tenor at the moment, but otherwise it'll look at the sentiment analysis of the review text. And if it's requesting changes, it prefers negativity because mostly the GIFs are generally like kind of like funny or, you know, they're not like truly evil and insulting. And so we're looking at the negative text because changes were requested. So we're kind of like saying, "Heh, you have to do changes. And so we're uh, looking at any keywords that were in the negative review. And we'll use that to search the GIFs API. If it's only a positive thing, then we'll use the positive. Otherwise, we fall back to some default words. And if someone approved a PR, it's the same thing, but we only look at the positive words or we fall back to a different set of positive words to fall back on. So it's just a fun way of adding a GIF to your pull request reviews. And this is something me and a couple of coworkers have been doing on our own and just like manually searching, finding a GIF, pasting it in. But it's nice to automate it and... So there is a little bit of a process improvement and it brings our coworkers together to all like laugh and chuckle as we do our work. So that's the idea. Together over the memes. Yes. It's the most important thing you can do. And if you look at the pull requests on that PR chatter action, you can see our test PRs and it's just full of like a bunch of reviews and rejections. And yeah, it was uh, fun to work with, with the other group on and uh, the... GitHub API uh, for actions, it was really difficult to figure out what the heck the structure is. And I don't know. It just, it was the the initial learning curve was just took a little while. There's so many docs out there yeah. and they all talk about these different APIs and things. So I'm like, I found like three different ways to describe, oh, the GitHub pull request event. And I'm like logging something, but I don't see it in the right format. It's just all over. But once we kind of figured out the structure and how it works, then we got moving along pretty quick. And then at the very end, I swapped over to using TypeScript and realized it would have been a lot easier had we done that in the beginning. Mm. But, oh well. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's out there. It's on the Action Marketplace. So Nice. I would like to uh, build, uh, I guess, one of these little bots for some stuff, and this could be a good way to do that. A couple like interesting comments about it is it only right now supports, if you're doing it in JavaScript, Node 12. <laughs> uh, you can also do it in Bash and stuff. So you, you can... I think it supports Docker as well. So you can kind of like fully own your stack if you want to. But for Node, it's just Node 12 right now. And it needs to all be self-contained. So they suggest checking in your Node modules folder and just using that. They also then say you can use... So there's a package called... It's at Vercel slash NCC, which is for like bundling... Mm -hmm node thing all together i think i don't know what it stands for some node compile or something or but it supports like javascript and typescript and a, a few of those things so it's just like a one package cli bundler and so we bundle our index.ts file and so we're using like es module syntax and we're and it just bundles it into the dist folder so there's an index.js file there and it also we pass in a licenses.txt file as well for all the licenses in the dependencies so doing that that helped and then we don't have to check in node modules, which makes Git way happier. Very cool. So yeah, I'm now looking forward even more for doing pull request reviews. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Those are all the topics I had. Okay. Well, Someone got a new computer, though. I did get a new computer, but you know, somebody else got a new computer. I kind of did. I placed the order during the fringe. <laughs> like two hours ago, you bought a computer. Congrats. Yeah, yeah. Well, it'll be here in a couple weeks. So we got we got a little bit, but. I got a little bit. Okay, well, I'll tell you about mine since it's pretty similar to what Brandon bought. Uh, so I ordered the M1 MacBook Pro 13-inch. I ordered maybe a, two weeks after the event. I think that was in November. So maybe I ordered, you know, like that Thanksgiving week. Of course, what that meant is I wasn't in the first wave of shipments. So I ended up getting my computer sometime mid-December. 
Uh, luckily, I was not not needing to wait until January, like many people were, for some of their BTO models. I think they may have not pre-built a ton of BTO models, so that kind of makes sense, because that's how BTO should work. But they also just didn't have a lot of supply to go, so they had to basically make and ship all time. So, like, not to talk about the computer too much, but I've never had a 13-inch MacBook Pro before. Oh, I've really? always had the big ones. Huh. Yeah, and wow, it's tiny, and it's cute. I've had a MacBook Air before. That was my computer during college. Yeah. And then, you know, roughly, like, they're, they're kind of the same size, you know, conceptually. But I've only really used professionally, though, the 16-inch MacBook Pro. Of course, those are Intel still. And wow, it is so tiny and cute. It's just, it's just kind of adorable. Like, I can carry it anywhere. It's so tiny. So that's fun. And, like, that's just a novelty to me. But the, the more interesting part for, for us here is how you can use it for development. So, you know, I, I have my... As the two of you know, I've had a lot of uh, pushing my computer to the limits problems lately, and uh, I don't restart my computer ever if I don't have to, and I will use all RAM and CPU performance available if I can. And so, you know, I, I, I have done a couple of not work things on the computer, but I've done things that are pretty close to it, so some pretty big builds, um, some pretty rigorous things, uh, CPU and memory-wise, and so... You know, Node works great on it. I, I'm running Node through Rosetta right now with Node 14 because I was too lazy to figure out how to fully compile native ARM. I believe now there is a native ARM build of Node 15. Uh -huh. So I guess people could use that if they're really interested. It'll work fine. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, I did get Rust nightly 133, I think, perhaps, maybe, to work on the ARM mode. And it is so fast. I think I ran the numbers, and it's like 100 times faster than the computer that I built in 2009. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, with all of the, um, that's with all of the compiler optimizations with the same compiler build on both machines. Like, it's a testament to the old machine that the compiler that we have today works back from way back then on that old AMD CPU. But it's just amazing that 100 times difference. That's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, um, and then the I kind of the biggest thing for me still is like Docker support is still coming along. I think the Docker support that they have is in preview, and when preview came out, you had to sign up kind of in a Google Doc, which is kind of fishy for many reasons. So I don't know if I haven't tried the new preview stuff now though, and so if it, if it is working better, that's great. But yeah, I, I'm looking forward to actually be able to run Docker on it because then I can actually use other other languages and stuff like java and not have to worry about anything so that'll be fun but as a computer it's fast it works great um so yeah it's great i think you'll like what you what you ordered a lot brandon yeah thanks i think i think so too i'm uh kind of using it to replace my uh, macbook pro uh which is the first 15 inch macbook pro i've ever purchased myself i had used one at work for a while but most of my macbooks um like my personal macbook prior to this one was 13 inches so like 13 inches was was the like macbook size for me for from like mm -hmm. i don't know college basically and then i had i had an air for work for a little while and then in advertising i got hooked on the 15 inch macbook oh i did think of one thing i don't like about it yeah what is it so it is annoying to me that there are only thunderbolt ports type c ports on one side uh-huh i i really like being able to charge from either side depending on whether i am you know, the chargers on the left side or the right side. It's it's just a really nice convenience factor, and, and this computer does not have that. Right. They're only on the left. I've definitely gotten used to that, too. Yeah. Well, with my Mac Mini, there's only one side that it can be powered on, and that's the <laughs> that's rear true, side. true, but it's also fixed kind of on your desk. You think I'm not going to be taking that with me everywhere I go, man? Because I might prove you wrong on that. Can you build a quote unquote laptop that's just some screen, like duct taped to a hinge with a keyboard, and then you just like Velcro the Mac Mini on the back? Oh, man. Don't tempt me with a good time. I know, right? Uh, there was a guy, one of our QA guys at work, who used to do that. Um, he would come into the office and he would take his Mac Mini out and put it on the desk and boot it up for testing. So, yeah, it's a real thing. Just because you can doesn't mean you need to. I mean, it it is kind of pocket sized if you, if you have sufficiently large pockets. It's it's pocket sized. That is how it, it is, works. It is pretty good good 
small size computer, but yeah. Yeah, I'm mostly going to use mine as a um, as a build machine, as an iOS build machine, because as I keep learning, every time I say I'm never going to do another iOS app, I'm never going to do another iOS app, it just keeps happening. It's inevitable. Because, yeah, I mean, and, you know, this is maybe a larger topic than we want to get into right now, but people really view it as like a prestige thing. Um, a website's fine. A website's great. A website can look snazzy as heck even if it is uh you know kind of implementing tron design as it were but at the end of the day when people sometimes for certain for certain use cases people are like i just want to install from the app store i just want to install from the app store i never need to find the link then because i just look for the icon on my phone totally get it and nobody nobody understands how to nobody understands how to um save a website to your home screen um, like that's not, that's not a thing that's so common that people do it. And so, you know, you, you can do that if you, if you have a small enough population that, you know, like, okay, yeah, these people can follow the two t- steps of instructions because we're not going to sink a month into getting through app review. But, you know, if you have people, if you, if, if you're, if you're targeting more or less the general public or, a, um, a population sufficiently large that is indistinguishable from the general public or might have general public level support issues, then it might be worth it. Um, it might be worth it because then you just say, just search our name in the app store, download it there. And it, you know, I, I, I'm excited about this because I think it's a really interesting challenge to replatform this in a subtle, in a subtler way than I have before, but replat replatform it in a way that allows it to really shine, um, on native as well. You just wanted to talk about replatforming. Replatforming. <laughs> and speaking of replatforming, I'll be replatforming my MacBook Pro into a... <laughs> Do a desktop machine so that I can build iOS apps on it. And then that'll basically be it. I, I, I really badly need to send my MacBook in for repair. And I know this because they closed my support case because it's been too long since I opened it. And I just, I can't, but I can't, Oh no! I can't split with my MacBook right. because my MacBook is, you know, to a certain degree, it's my entire livelihood. So if I send that back, you know, they're going to wipe yeah, it. Then you can't do anything. Yeah, they're going to wipe it. That's fine. But I'm totally, yeah, I'm totally, you know, up a creek without a paddle because uh, the, because I'd literally be paddling with my MacBook if, if it came down to it. All that is to say, it's going to be nice to have a dedicated iOS build machine so that I can shift more of that burden to any of my myriad other machines that I have. Because I can do perfectly fine development on my XPS. I can do perfectly fine development on my Windows and Linux desktop. I can do perfectly fine development in some situations on my iPad Pro. But I can't abide... Like I, At the end of the day, I'm going to need a way to run iOS builds, and I'm going to need a way to do them somewhat close to local fidelity because there are some things you can't debug outside of using the simulator and i love my mac mini dedicated instance that i have um through mac stadium i love it i love it i love it but having the latency of doing remote desktop stuff with that while it's in las vegas and i'm here is very very frustrating and you know where i'm never going to be for the next six months to a year anywhere other than my apartment uh so you know we just we shut down the office um so it's not like i'm going to be at WeWork or anything and, and be like oh you know i really wish i were at home next to my mac mini where i could run ios builds no i'm always going to be at my desk my desk is now is now my desk which is a thing that i haven't ever you know maybe been able to say at any time previous and so um having a desktop mac mini is not going to be a huge deal I can just VNC in from my XPS or from my iPad if I want to when uh, when I want to uh, work on it when I'm not literally at my desk, um, like from one of my other exciting locales such as the couch or the dining table or my Ooh, car. It's you mixing it up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, yeah New York's hottest club is my dining room table. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, I don't know. That's exciting. The other nice thing is you'll be very prepared for the next wave of... You know, whatever whatever goes on with Mac OS, because you know your 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 Mac Mini will actually have the M1, and it'll be ready to go for whatever else they do. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to be ready for that, and then I'm also excited at the compile time. I think you know iOS app compiles are are nothing to sneeze at on my MacBook Pro, but I think I I am anticipating there will be some degree of a boost. It'll either be as fast or slightly faster. Yeah, exactly. And especially especially given, you know, I'm basically replacing it with a SKU that has roughly the same, um, you know, memory and storage as my current Pro. And then, you know, the processor speed, like, 
Sure. You know, like JavaScript bundling. Yeah, that's probably going to be RAM bound more than it's CPU bound. But actual like app building in Xcode, like the like the like the build and analyze cycle or build and archive. Um, build God and forbid. analyze. Build and analyze. Yeah, that was a throwback. <laughs> Accidental. Oh, that was a good one. I didn't mean to. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's. I, I think that's probably going to be the biggest thing is because really the the thing that frustrates me about a lot of this stuff, right? Or the, or the thing that can be frustrating is when you have issues that are unrelated to the actual thing you're trying to do. When I'm like, oh, you know, like it, it takes 10 minutes to, I don't know, do some task that has nothing to do with the code I wrote. It's just like a build task that's screwing up. And that happens all the time in... Uh, Bitrise and um, App Center. As much as I love App Center, App Center is a great product. But I just don't do enough of this work to justify the ongoing cost of some of that stuff. Um, and now you can argue if I get a Mac Mini, you know, it's going to take a while to amortize that twelve hundred bucks or whatever. But is it? It's not really. It's going to take a year of uh, Mac Stadium or a year of uh, App Center. And then you get to keep the hardware. Yeah, and then any any time anything I use after that is 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 gravy. So you know, so long as I'm using this machine for two years, then I'm I'm ahead. That's uh that's how I view it. And and then I have a Mac, a modern Mac, rather than my poor butterfly keyboard display slowly failing MacBook Pro. That's only two years old. So that's what I'm hyped about. Well, look forward to hearing about it. It should be a good time. I'll I'll get an M1 or an Apple Silicon Mac at some point, but. Maybe later this year, maybe next year. Who knows? Not not immediately. So let's just avoid talking about all the rumors about a Mac Mini Pro and yeah. updated Pros because I don't want to think about that. I don't know. We'll just return it. We'll, we'll know when they come out, and it's just hypotheticals until then. So. Exactly. Well, uh, Brandon, let's hear about some of your uh, Twitter follows. Yes, <laughs> as always. If you want to call it that, it's time for my Twitter followees, which means it's time for some sad music links. Um, so this, this month, uh, I've got three, um, exquisite, sad songs, sad, sad music. Uh, even if it's peppy, sometimes it's sad by, uh, three really great, sad musicians, uh, starting with Arlo Parks, a a musician out of London who, uh, has been seeing more and more play on the radio, uh, recently. Their stuff is really good and really kind of, I don't know, there's, there's kind of, a almost a, like, uh, not not quite, but but there's some kind of through lines to Tracy Chapman, I feel like, in some of her stuff. So please, please, please check it out. I'll also throw uh, Julian Baker, uh, one of uh, one of uh, Sad Indie Music's, you know, triumvirate uh, Godhead three in one. Uh, for for those of you uh, unaware of uh, the Sad Music triumvirate, you've got Julian Baker, um, Lucy Dacus, and Phoebe Bridgers, uh, who together form a supergroup bo- Boy Genius. Definitely, definitely, definitely uh, track their stuff because um, they make some of the best and saddest music you will ever hear. Um, so if you want to get a good cry in, I highly recommend Phoebe Bridger's recent album, Punisher, uh, or anything by Lucy Dacus or anything by Julian Baker. Julian Baker has a new album coming out. And so I linked to one of the tracks from that album. And then last but not least, we've got Claro and S.G. Lewis. This is an older track, but it's one that I really like called Better. Uh, I think uh, there's somebody on Twitter. I should see if I can find the tweet. But uh, uh, basically, it boils down to um, if you're if you're not a Claro fan, what are you doing? Claro is amazing. Uh, I think I think the tweet is like something like all my homies stand Claro or something like that. I'll see if I can find it. And there you go. This has been Brandon's sad music corner because even if it's happy music, it's still sad. See you next time. Anyway, back to Twitter followees. Brian, what do you got? I'm just going to quick comment, say I've heard of almost none of those people. I think I've, I've heard of Phoebe Bridgers, but yeah. that's about it. And um, <laughs> you've only heard of Phoebe Bridgers because I've told I've told you about Phoebe Bridgers, probably. I've no, I've I've seen it on, on Twitter as well. I think people have commented. Yeah. And I think I had an old roommate who had a Phoebe Bridgers album cover on oh, the wall. Yeah, you got it. Point. You got but, it. Those are the rules. But other than that. I've no, I've no idea what the genre or anything, so I, I only know the name. Oh, well, Brian, I hate to say it, but the genre is sad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, that's not, that's not a genre I really ever seek out for music. Oh, uh, let's so. see. So Phoebe Bridgers has a really good Twitter name too. So Phoebe Bridgers will be my one true Twitter followee. See, it's all connected. Trader Joe is her Twitter name. T R A I T O R Joe. Yeah, there you Amazing. go. Amazing. So there you go. But that has concluded my Twitter followees. Follow Phoebe Bridgers. Gotcha. Who who's the the actress whose uh, 
stars in uh, Fleabag. Uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge, who is also yeah. iconic, but for other I reasons. I was confused with the two of them because everyone was talking about Phoebe Bridgers. I'm like, oh, it's the the the, the great like comedian actress, and then I'm like, oh no, it's definitely not the same person. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, okay, Twitter followies. Um, I followed a few people. First is Zach Leatherman, who is the creator of Eleven T. You've heard me talk a lot about Eleven T, so I thought I would follow Zach. Uh, he also runs the Eleven T, uh, the official Eleven T Twitter account, who uh, is often uh, retweeting things. I follow that as well. Uh, next up is at Noopcat or uh, Suze Hinton, who's a uh, uh, programmer over at Stripe. So I've I've seen her tweets get uh, retweeted a bunch uh, over the last I don't know few weeks or whatever. So uh, notably, one that I've seen a lot is the account at Craig Weekend which is just Daniel Craig saying, ladies and gentlemen, the weekend from when he was a host on SNL. <laughs> and it's it got an account with 70,000 followers and it's just re- tweeting that four second clip over and over and over every Friday. It's great. I like that kind of stuff. Me too. Let's see. And finally, um, we got uh, Marcos Tanaka, who's uh, an iOS developer who makes Music Harbor and Music Smart. Music Harbor is the app that I've been using to uh, follow a bunch of artists that I listen to. Um, oh, so this is a music one too, Brandon, but this one's a little more close to Twitter, I guess, since I'm following the developer. Yeah, so it, uh, it goes through and just will alert you when an artist releases new music. So I use that. Uh, and I find that most artists release music on Fridays, and that's like literally the only day of the week that music is released for some reason. So I wonder why that is. But yeah, that's what I followed on Twitter. What about you, Ryan? Yeah, so the other day, uh, AOC had um, some guest speakers on a Twitch stream she was using to cover the strange Wall Street GameStop stuff that's been going on here in the latter end of January. And so uh, one of the guests was Alexis Goldstein, and so she did a really great recap on you know, what was going on and like, what are the technical parts? What are the financial parts and sort of where, where it kind of has gone and is going. And so, yeah, I followed here on Twitter and it's kind of cool. Nice. Yeah. I watched part of that stream as well as learned, learned a lot about the, the stonks as they say. They say that. Yes. Very nice. I, I, I bought some stonks today, but they're very boring. That's how stonks should be. no, yeah, no, they should be. Vanguard 2060, my friends. It's uh what 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 do the redditors say? It's it's on a rocket ship, but the rocket ship is very slow because uh, the the point is that we can retire in 2060 if there's a 2060 to retire in. There you go. Yeah, and Wall Street Bets is doing the expanse version of a rocket ship where they inject themselves with uh stuff to let them experience higher g's than a normal human body probably normally could that sounds terrifying yeah they might be crazy but that's okay (laughs) uh yes what a week every week week this month of january has had something something rather extraordinarily (laughs) out of the normal going on so so are you just excited for next week or what it's gonna be a whole thing yeah what could be coming next time is 2021 a leap year or anything shouldn't be it's an odd number, so no, I don't think a leap year, no. Okay, just making sure. You never know. Maybe they changed it. Maybe they changed it. That's that's the thing. <laughs> the Pope is the Pope in charge of leap years? I don't think so. I think he might be. That's that's my harmless conspiracy theory, is that the Pope is in charge of leap years. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to fact check that later. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fact check it right now. It's false. But anyway, uh, this is cool. This is fun. This is a nice little prompt podcast episode, more or less. Uh, what are you guys up to, uh, next between now and the next time? Well, it's currently winter. Oh man. Uh, so I'm going to do not much. Same. I'm going to keep walking around Lake of the Isles. I'll keep going skiing every few weeks, maybe at Afton Alps or something. That's okay. If you want to just like, you know, stay inside, you know, keep warm, keep warm, drink some chocolate. Yeah. Drink lots of chocolate. (laughs) Um, but whatever you do, just don't fill your rings. That'd be great. Um, hmm. for people who you're in activity competitions with who sh- shall not be named. Yeah, I wonder who that is. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, whoever they are, it's just on this. It's just on this teleprompter I've got here um, that says I'm supposed I'm to say. I'm surprised you haven't somehow tried to convince me to get an iPhone and to watch, <laughs> so you can just clobber you too. No, well, because so, I will never do a thing. I mean, I'll take the dog out, you know, a couple times a day, and that's it. So for sure, you'll win. Well, Ryan, if you set your move goal to 100 calories a day, then you're gonna hit all the records, and you'll be beating Brandon too. So. Okay, well, I mean, I don't. I'm not gonna get an iPhone, so I guess I, I don't know how, if the, how that factors into the uh, to the <laughs> the contest. Yeah, it exempts you from it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Let's see. What about next? Anything else next month? I'm on call for work, so that's uh, thrilling in a not exciting way. Yeah, the days are getting longer, so that's nice. Time is moving. I will say, while this happened, I just got a notification adding insult to injury that Brian just closed all three of his rings. <sighs> oh i was just swinging my arm it must have counted as standing i've been sitting in a chair this yeah whole time. it must have <laughs> that's amazing yeah well uh where can we find you all on the internet to stay in touch you can find me just about anywhere but mostly uh i don't actually know where you can find me anymore uh probably on twitter where i'm brandon underscore mn or instagram where i'm also brandon underscore mn on Instagram, that's where I post lots of pictures of things that I'm baking because baking is a coping mechanism. Um, and then uh, I also uh, sometimes am on GitHub, I guess. I don't know. What else? Oh, Brandon.mn is my website, which is going to change very, very rapidly because I am trying to make a new portfolio in 2021. That's one of my goals. New portfolio, new me. The content, not the, not the domain, right? Not the domain. No, of course not. No, that domain is priceless. I, the city of Brandon, Minnesota can pry it from my cold, dead hands. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yeah, that's, re- that's another place you can find me is at some point this summer, I want to do a road trip to Brandon, Minnesota. Um, and just take, take a picture there and be like, hey, I'm the mayor now. I sense a new profile photo. Oh my God. Yeah, that'd be perfect. There you go. <laughs> now we got it. That's, that's the answer. It's actually not that far from here. I'm just lazy. So maybe I'll make it happen for my 25th birthday, which has already passed. But, you know. Delayed celebration. Time doesn't matter anymore. So, you know, let's yeah. do that. Well, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me, which has a bunch of new updates, the Leventy and some styling and stuff. And I'm, I'll probably keep tweaking it. If you find any bugs, let me know. Hit, hit, hit me up on Twitter. Yeah. What about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at RyanMR.com. Well, that's not right. <laughs> just RyanMR. And on my website, RyanMR.com, which I think still goes to some Google 404 page. That's good. And um, maybe sometime soon you can also find me on my newest domain, DevastatedWasteland.com. Ayo. Very nice. nice. And uh, you can check out the show notes for this episode at TheNexus.tv slash PK64. Uh, you can discuss it with all your friends over on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And if you like what we're doing here at the network, swing on over to patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Uh, you can also tweet at the Nexus TV on Twitter. Uh, and yeah, with that, have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. Bye. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.